Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Dreaming Forward podcast. I'm Kaylin Wilson. And I'm Shalon Johnson. And today we're going to be introducing our new series called Our Leaders Born, Not Built. We're excited to talk to you about what it takes to be a leader, what it looks like to be a leader in your own life, and how to enjoy your own leadership. I'm looking forward to chatting with you all this month. I know Shalon is as well, so let's just get right into it. So here's the question. Are leaders born, not built? Right. I guess I will add my two cents. (laughs) Um, Are leaders born or built? Let's see. So this is a tricky one a little bit, right? Because... Um, normally I would say that leaders are built and that's it, like straight to the point. However, I do have a child and there are some qualities that you see in babies Mm -hmm. that just carries them about life. And there's no explanation for that really, because Mm -hmm. who's teaching a baby, you know, Mm -hmm. I mean, infant stage, like there are things that she has done when she was an infant, that she's still doing. Wow. And that's like, how could you teach from the womb? Not that you can't. That's a whole nother story. You can't. Right, right, right. But from this perspective, like, I think there I think there are things that are you are born with. I think so. Yeah. Um, and leaders are also built. I think so. I think it's a combination of both in some instances. And I think it really de- depends on um, your genetic makeup. Mm. Um, I think that has a lot to do with it, honestly. Um, Yeah, girl, that's what I think. I I was trying, I was like, I'm not going to interrupt. I'm not going to interrupt because I've always thought that leaders were born. Mm. But I think that the expression of their leadership is what's built. There are some people that no matter how much you encourage and pour into them, they do not have what it takes to be a leader. Yep. And then there are some people that you could put them in quite literally any scenario. And mm-hmm. even without them trying, people are going to look to them to lead. Yep. <laughs> and that's yep. not something that gets built. I think for many of the born leaders that I've met, If I'm going to be honest, the people who thought that they could build leadership often crush that person into hiding. Mm. So when I think about, we could take it back to elementary school. Mm -hmm. There were people who were different. They had a unique quality about them, but they were so clear on a go forward vision or so clear on what was possible that other people may not have even heard of and they were often ridiculed into silence and I've seen some of those people since blossom into their own blossom into brave and being brave enough to still stand and shine their light but that's not easy And then I can think of so many people who were just conditioned and given all the opportunities and all of the accolades and all the things, all the stuff that you think like, oh, my God, this person is just going to take over the world. Yeah. And then they do nothing with it or at least nothing positive. And the world is not made better through their contributions. So, yeah, yeah, I think for me, it's definitely more so born. Mm -hmm. And I want to be clear, too, that titles don't make you a leader right (laughs) titles just put you in a position you can have the title of a leader and be the consummate follower Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it just means that you sit in the spot where somebody should be leading but it doesn't mean that you in fact are leading and Mm -hmm. so i would want to challenge people to think about what does your in what ways does your position match up with your character? Mm. And in what ways do they differ? Mm-hmm. So you got me thinking about elementary school since you brought that up, right? Mm-hmm. 
And so unfortunately, when I think about elementary school, I and I'm thinking about the leaders, some of the leaders, not all of them, some of them were bullied. Mm -hmm. And so some context, I went to school in Brownsville, Brooklyn. Yeah. If you do not know what that is, look it up. Um, but it wasn't always because it was such a I guess hard-ish neighborhood. It mm-hmm. wasn't always celebrated that you were a leader. Mm-hmm. Now there were some natural born leaders in elementary school that were celebrated. Mm. Right. And they did get those accolades and recognition and praise and all of that. Right. Mm-hmm. But if I could think about one particular person that was a leader in their own right, the whole class bullied that person. Mm. And it was because, I guess, from a child's brain, it looked like they were the teacher's pet or, you know, because mm. the person that's like, you didn't check the homework today. And we're like, yo, shut up. What are you, what are you doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so that person, while they were a leader, they were bullied so bad. And so yeah. I only say that to say we were very young at that point. Yeah. And nobody taught them how to lead per se. So maybe they were born leaders at that point. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's so interesting because when you think about teaching leadership, it's really just teaching the patterns of people who have done stuff and experimented stuff before. Yeah. So all leadership research, all leadership pedagogy, all of that is phenomenological, meaning it is studying the phenomena of people who have done it before. Mm -hmm. And that in and of itself is an imperfect measure. So we tried to study animals. We tried to study plants. We tried to study people from times past. Leadership studies, leadership uh, research, leadership principles are based on an imperfect science. And so I would encourage listeners to kind of take it with a grain of salt because Mm -hmm. the world may not have seen your leadership style yet. Mm -hmm. Your Mm -hmm. community, your company, your family may not have seen the type of leader you are. Mm -hmm. And just because people haven't seen it doesn't invalidate it. It just means that the phenomenon has not been observed up to this point. So maybe the question, instead of our leaders born, not built, it could be our leaders repeating existing styles or our leaders pioneering new ones. I would say it's existing. It's, it's learned behavior, Mm. which is also a theory. Um, And that's with anything. Like there are some instances where things will be pioneered because it hasn't been done before. But leadership has been done before. A long time ago. Um, Like not thousands, millions of years ago. And so why reinvent the wheel? Now, people may come up with a different style of leadership or think they are. But I guarantee you that it's just going to be a compilation of what's already out there. Mm. Okay, I see what you're saying. So it's synthesizing existing phenomena Mm -hmm. to create something that's new to you for the context in which you're leading. Right. I like that because that can apply to your personal life, with your family, with your friends. It can apply at work. I've learned so much about how to be a better friend through work. And some of that is because I build my, a lot of my friendships through work because I've relocated so many times. So the easiest way to meet people is just going to your job every day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think watching people interact in group settings, period, can be a helpful study for you to build how you express leadership in your life. And that can be applied in multiple scenarios. Right. I think that 
as people are before you actually go and do that experiment, that research, right? You have to really understand what leadership is mm. and know how to know when you are a leader. And for me, you described that a little bit earlier without using the word that I was thinking of, which is influence. Mm. Usually, mm, okay. So usually the most influential person in a room, they're designated the leader, right? Yes. But here's where it spins a little bit because the most influential person in the room is not always the positive person. No, it or could, the person with the most power. That too. Yeah. So you gotta, you gotta look at it on both sides. So um, wait, so let's back up for one second because mm -hmm. I think it would be helpful to define for folks what is the difference between power, privilege, influence, and inequity. I define this a lot for folks in trainings and you and I yeah. talk about it all the time as we design. Girl, let's let's bust out the Webster's Dictionary then. Yes, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. Okay, so power is direct authority. It means that you are a key decision maker and that you can sign a document or click a button and it's expected that you would have control over a situation. Usually there are, are certain titles that come along with it. So if you think about parent and child, there's power there. If you think about supervisor to employee, there's power there, et cetera. Influence on the other hand is indirect. And in a lot of cases, quiet. Control from the standpoint that you are often looked at to manipulate situations or control situations regardless of the actual power or direct authority you have. So if you think about the way people consider executive assistance, the CEO has the power, but the executive assistant has the influence. So yeah. they can potentially get you the favor of that person just by mentioning like, oh, have you talked to so-and-so? They seemed really nice. They were very polite to me when I talked to them. So yeah. now the person with power is paying a little bit more attention. Yeah. Privilege. How could I describe pri privilege? Is the concessions and the special access that we have that fundamentally shape and change our experience. So for example, I have privilege because of my education. I am able, I'm assumed to know certain things regardless of whether or not I actually know it. I am assumed to, in some cases, behave a certain way. Yeah. I am assumed to have a certain level of competence just because of letters. So Shalon had a lot of privilege when we worked together in New York because she's a native New Yorker. So there were certain things that she knew about the system, certain things that she knew about the culture, the rhythm that made it easier for her to understand other things. And I was really struggling. Mm. And privilege is also what you don't have to experience. Yeah. So, for example, men often have trouble understanding when women describe misogyny and the ways that it impacts their life. And they have trouble understanding it because these are things that they've never had to experience. As a woman, I'm constantly thinking, OK, I need to have mace when I go to walk my dog. I need to make sure I have a flashlight. I need to. And this is not to watch out for deer, you know, or other wild animals. This is, I don't know if it's going to be a random man or person yeah. lurking in the shadows. Right. For a lot of men, they can't even conceptualize that, right. especially straight men, because I'm not hiding from anybody. If somebody runs up on me, I probably feel prepared to at the very least try to defend myself. I don't have that same confidence exactly. as a woman. And so it's the privilege of not having to think of that. It's the privilege of not having to imagine whether or not uh, for women having the privilege to not have to wonder, is there going to be a baby changing station in the restroom? 
Do I have to go out with a partner to make sure that my child can be safely changed and not on the floor? Because everybody thinks to put baby changing stations in women's bathrooms, we're having to push and fight to put them in men's bathrooms. So that's, again, privilege is the concessions, but then also the access and the the give being given things, being given access to things, being given the benefit of the doubt. So two sides to that. So finally, inequity is the stratification of the human experience based on various identity dimensions. So Shalon and I are obviously both black women, but Shalon is from New York. I'm from Detroit. Shalon is younger than me. I'm older than Shalon. Shalon is a mom and I am child free right now. You are a dog mom, Kayla. I am a dog mom. So I have a dog. (laughs) (laughs) Y'all probably hear him snoring. Um, But that's a different, right? It's a different dynamic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so inequity inequity in and of itself i almost want to say is a neutral word and we go on somewhere with this y'all inequity in and of itself i would not necessarily say that it's bad because i think humans naturally are conditioned to treat people differently the more different you are but it doesn't mean that you are out to abuse someone but inequity has become an issue because the restriction of access, the restriction of support, the restriction of needed supports just to live Mm -hmm. has now created horrible experiences for others. How does this all fit into the leadership conversation? Because number one, how you see yourself as either being born or built as a leader is largely determined by the amount of power, influence, and privilege you experience is also determined by the amount of inequity you experience and Mm -hmm. are the object of. If someone is double, triple, quadruple, et cetera, marginalized, it can be super difficult to see themselves as a born leader. And they may feel like they have to be built. And that's almost insurmountable because of the amount of inequity they experience, especially day to day because of their identity dimensions because we're taught that leadership looks like this and this does not look like you so when you're assessing whether or not you are born or built as a leader unpack who you think a leader is to begin with and it's always a who whenever we're conceptualizing leadership we're always usually thinking of a person or people What do they look like? Do they look like you? Do they not look like you? Are they totally opposite from all of what and who you are? Why do you think that? Why do you feel that way? Unpacking that is going to be an important journey in your own journey as a leader. Okay, so let's get into, is everyone a leader, right? Um, No, (laughs) is the short answer. No, everyone is not a leader. I think the most important thing here is to know how to assess yourself and identify whether you are a leader or not. Mm. Um, now, that's not to say you aspire to be a leader, that you cannot be a leader. Mm-hmm. You just need to know what to do to get there. And that could be a, um, a combination of things. So that could be certain degree programs, certain certificates, reading certain books, getting around the right people, Mm -hmm. um, like-minded individuals, going to certain places so that you can immerse yourself in that leadership environment. Like that takes a lot of work to actually evolve into a leader Mm -hmm. if that is what you want to do. However, I don't think everyone is a leader. There are people in leadership positions that should not be. Yeah. And you need to be able to say, I am not a leader even if you are one of those people in those positions, you need to be able to step down and not even think about the money. Cause a lot of y'all are in it for the money. <laughs> oh, correct. So to to step down and find another career if you are not good at it. We can end it on that. Assess yourself, <laughs> check yourself. Because everyone potentially has the capacity 
to lead at least themselves, but not everyone is a leader of other people. Yeah. Tell us in the comments down below whether or not you think leaders are born or built. And are you a leader? Were you born a leader? Do you feel like your leadership capacity was built over time? Let us know in the comments. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share this with everyone else that you know who could learn so much about leadership. Until next time, see y'all. Bye.